All right, please welcome in Kalena Azabuki, Warriors television analyst, joining us here on the Brian No Show. And just before we started this interview, I told Kalena, because I always tell everybody how hungry I am. I haven't figured it out in the morning. I'll eat on my commute in, and I need to bring snacks because I'm starving. You haven't eaten yet today. It's almost 1130, Kalena. Nothing? Nothing in the furnace yet? This is kind of normal for me. I know breakfast is an important meal of the day, and it's one of my favorite, but usually I, I work out first before I eat. And I worked out today, and I just haven't eaten yet. Forgot about the eating part, so, so I'm going to eat. After. You reminded me. Now I'm hungry. Now I'm really hungry, and I got to go through this whole interview super <laughs> hungry. Thanks to you. Sorry about that, man. Sorry, My whining has hurt your general well-being here. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> But you work out on an empty stomach? All the time. All the time. I just got used to it. I just got used to it. I think it's it's something The Rock does, too, just in case you're interested. It is a thing. People <laughs> really? do do this. But it's, it's, it's actually, I think, pretty healthy to do that. And it's just a habit now. And I'm, I almost don't feel right unless I work out on an empty stomach. If I eat before I work out in the morning, I'm just like, man, I'm, I'm lazy today. Uh-huh. It doesn't feel right. So yeah. I, it's something I do, just kind of intermittent fasting. So, yeah, this is I've, – I've gone plenty of days where I haven't eaten till two, three. Wow. Something like that. Two yeah. or three. Wow. I think you're on to something here, right? Because before a game, you wouldn't load up and eat a bunch of food. So if you're going to hit the gym right. or do a workout – it makes sense not to do the same thing. And plus, I think just for myself, I'd be more angry in the weight room. Like, I'm freaking starving over it. And I would be maybe banging out more weight that way. That's good, right? Just take your anger on the waist. Just like, oh, I'm so hungry. I got, you know, you just got to, <laughs> whatever it takes, man, fire you up and then take it out on the weights. You, you work out even better. By the way, I have to ask before we get to hoops, because you were always in great shape. You were a, a muscular player. What was... At the peak of your strength, what was the most impressive thing you could do in the weight room? <laughs> interesting. That's an interesting question. I was never really a bench person because in college, they would have me bench and do everything everybody else was doing, and I would just get massive, just like oh. veins popping out bodybuilder style to where I'm losing touch on my jumper. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. if you do too much in there... You'll lose some touch. My arms get all big. I'm having trouble keeping my elbow in and all that stuff. So, honestly, most of the stuff I do now is just body weight stuff and pull-ups, planks, all of that stuff, sit-ups. But the most impressive thing, it's it's hard to even say. I, I can't remember what my max bench was at one time. You know what's funny? Really... You would get a kick out of this because there was some guy – who set the plank like world record and he held plank for over eight hours. It was crazy. So he did See, this I on can't the do show that. one time. We tried to hold it as long as we could. How long, if you had to, how long do you think okay. you could hold plank for? The longest I've gone, I think, is like seven minutes. That's pretty good, man. But I even even going like two minutes is tough for me. But <laughs> I'll usually go like a minute 30. So I, 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 I have this thing where I go six minutes, but it's not all on one plank. It's front, then you got to go to the side without touching the ground, then you got to go to the other side without touching the ground. Yeah. And back to the front. So it's six minutes of that, one minute each. Man, but that's a, that's, the yeah. most I've ever done on one is, is seven minutes on the front. That's legit, man. Okay, Kalena Azubuki with us, Warriors television analyst here on the Brian No Show. Let's talk some hoops, man. Like, bring us up to date with the Warriors. We're watching the Blazers game in, game out. For someone who hasn't watched the Warriors game in, game out, what would you say is just team-wise, like a strength and a weakness, somewhere where they're vulnerable? Their ball movement offensively is really good. They're the best in the league when it comes to assists. But when they're at their best, it's just fluid offense, ball movement, a lot of cutting, a lot of taking advantage of what the defense is giving you, taking advantage of mistakes. Steph coming off of pin downs, two defenders go with Steph. The roller at the screener will get a layup. 
they do a lot of that where Steph is a decoy and his movement, his energy, his natural energy just infuses an energy into the offense. And then they've really improved defensively, top five defensively right now. And they're locked in. It's mostly because of Draymond. He is really setting the tone on that side. And they have a lot of length and a lot of athleticism on the defensive side. And when they're at their best, that shows. They had just won three in a row. And (laughs) they ran up against this team called the Los Angeles Lakers. And things didn't go very well. They didn't really do anything right didn't do anything well and the Lakers were really mad about the last meeting they had where the Warriors came back from 19 down and beat them and so LeBron James came in the game saying we're not losing this game we're not losing this game I'm personally going to be responsible for making sure the Lakers win this game and that's what happened from the jump they were knocking down threes which the Lakers aren't even really a great three-point shooting team they're knocking down threes they were getting to the rim they're getting to the free throw line they're forcing turnovers so the Warriors are probably going to come out with a sense of urgency tonight because they need to bounce back from that defeat. And it was a bad one because they got hit in the mouth. But they want to get back to doing what they were doing offensively and defensively. And then one of the issues the Warriors have had is this thing where they foul a little too much, where they foul unnecessarily, even if they're not in a bad way and it's not a threatening drive, they'll still hack every now and then. So that's been kind of a a season long thing. That's been an issue for the Warriors, but they've had games where they've been good and stayed away from Fallon. So it's possible, but this there, I think they're still overachieving. When you look at their season, some of the wins that they've had, the impressive wins, obviously you remember against the Blazers, Steph had 62. And so they're looking forward to playing the Blazers, but obviously the Blazers had a nice win against Charlotte. Uh, the Blazers are really good offensively when they're at their best. Damian Lillard is a problem. I think for 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 the Blazers, uh, Gary Trent Jr. and who's a Anthony Simons have stepped up their scoring and and they're shooting really well from three point range since McCollum has been out. Nurkic has been out, and so. And then Cantor, you got to say Cantor is playing extremely well too. So the Warriors realize that that you're, the Blazers starting five that they have right now is playing really well offensively. So they're going to take this game seriously. They're going to take this game really seriously, especially because of how they played against the Lakers their last game. They had a couple of days off to think about it against the game against a team like that. And, and after a game like that, you probably want to turn right around and play again. But the Warriors have been itching to get back out there for sure. I love all that information. That was really well done by you. I also, I have to say, that text tone is strong as well. It's like you doing plank. That was a ding. It was like, I'm letting you know there is a text coming through right now. I heard that. I was like, wait, that that is a strong text tone. I like that. Well done. (laughs) Very crisp. (laughs) Yeah. I like what you said about Steph being a decoy at times. And if you walk us through that, like think of superstar players being comfortable with being a decoy at times. Would you say this is a little bit different with Steph being comfortable d- playing that role at times? It is a little different because Steph loves it. He loves just being able to create an easy bucket for his teammates just from moving. And a lot of times he doesn't have to touch the ball at all. It's just he comes off a pin down. You got Draymond Green with the ball. And Draymond, that's been one of his strengths really his whole career, but especially this season, is just anticipating what pass is going to be there and almost making the pass before uh, his teammate knows it's coming. So Steph, it's just one of his deadliest weapons, his movement without the ball. And you really have to be in shape to guard this man. And even then, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to stop working at some point because the guy just doesn't stop. It's it's really ridiculous. He's running marathons out there. And I can't imagine being on the defensive end and trying to keep up with him. And then obviously having this thing in your head where this is the greatest shooter in the world. I can't leave him. Can't ever leave this man. Don't ask my teammates. Don't ask me about help. Don't look to me for, for weak side help. If I'm on Steph, I got this guy. And so... All your teammates are thinking that too. Anytime he crosses paths with someone. And so it happens every game. A bunch of times where two defenders go with Steph 
the guy that was originally on him, and then the defender that's guarding the screener to help. And everybody's trying to take Steph away, and then the Warriors get an easy layup because the roller is rolling straight to the rim with no one on him. So it happens a lot. One thing Steph also does is he he likes to set back screens. They run plays for him to set back screens because of the same concept. If you're the screener, usually your defender is supposed to offer some kind of help or bump the guy that's getting the screen off his path to the rim. But again, they're just staying hugged up on Steph. So when he sets a screen, if he catches a piece of that defender he's trying to screen, it's a layup for his teammates if they don't switch it. So they run that, they run down screens for Kelly Oubre. You'll probably see that at some point. It comes off a of split action, Steph cuts down there, he sets the screen for Oubre. Again, the same thing, just catch a piece of Oubre's man. It's a layup because he's right at the rim. They, he starts under the basket, then he just cuts to the rim and it's really close. There's no time to recover for his defender when Steph gets a piece of him. So it's, it's all that kind of action that they actually run they run plays for and then a lot of times it just comes within the floor of the offense where just Steph is just moving around and they'll make a mistake and Draymond will make them pay for the mistake so it's really beautiful to watch but everybody knows it I think the Blazers are aware of it that it happens a lot but you'll see the Warriors will get a few easy buckets just just off of that kind of action how about with Steph after that Lakers blowout that you mentioned he said that there are teams that still want to beat them down badly because the Warriors have been so successful the last five, six years. Do you think he's on to something with that? And also, what do you think the, the fan base in general thought about that opinion by Steph? I think he's on to something. I think it's true. I, the Warriors were pretty dominant for a long time and, and handed out some, some beatdowns. <laughs> some some beatdowns all over the league. And you don't forget about that. People do hold grudges. Teams hold grudges. And so no one feels bad for the Warriors that Clay is out. Obviously, everybody wants Clay healthy, but teams are going to come out and try to kick the Warriors in the mouth. And that's what happened with the Lakers. And the Warriors just didn't play well, though, too. It's, it's not like the Warriors just got ransacked and they couldn't do anything about it. They, they just didn't hold up their end of the bargain. Maybe it would have been a close game if they came out and played the way they had been playing. But... They seemed just a little flat. They were missing layups. They just nothing nothing was really going well. Steph didn't have his biggest game. But it he is on to something. And I think the Warriors realize that and they remind themselves in game. I think Draymond said at halftime, that's what Steph said. And so the fan base here understands that. This this fan base is really smart and really engaged. By the way, we miss them at games. And it's it's been super weird not having them. But there is the dub hub. They are on the screens, the video board, all the way across the court there. But everybody kind of realizes that. And everybody's anxious to, to get back to full form, which is with Clay in the mix. A healthy Clay, a healthy Steph, Draymond in there, James Wiseman with a year under his belt. So we're talking about next year. And, and what that can be and fantasizing about that as a fan base. But no one's just kind of throwing this year out. And the Warriors are super competitive and they want to win. And they realize that they still have a team that can make some noise. And they want to make some noise. And they want to be the best that they can be and get back to that winning culture. So that when next year, that winning mentality, so that when next year comes around, they're all ready to go and and be the best that they can be next season but it's it's been an interesting season again i still think the warriors have overachieved but there there's definitely teams that remember what they did to them when they were dominant that five six year run and the warriors remember that as well so they just have to be cognizant of that and realize that they're still going to get a lot of teams best shot because steph's on the team and because of that five six year run and just come out, you got to match their intensity. And the Warriors really didn't match the Lakers' intensity that last game. So you're, you're trying to get off to, to faster starts and just get yourself into the game, get your energy up, get your intensity up right from the start. He's Kalena Azabuki, Warriors television analyst here on the Brian No Show. I want to get your opinion. You've got some thoughts on the Mello LaMelo three to the dome <laughs> thing. What's going through your mind on this one? Yeah, so 
the Charlotte game that we had on our broadcast, I was I said something about LaMelo and his celebration that he does, the three fingers to the dome, like Carmelo. So I, I've I've graded celebrations in the past just for fun. And it was just a fun thing. So part of the joke is to kind of sound super serious, like I'm really analyzing it. And so so during the game, so he does the three fingers to the dome. And during the game, I'm actually thinking in my head, like I'm giving LaMelo props. Like what was running through my head was, this guy's going to be a superstar in the league. So he can, he should come up with his own celebration. So people start copying him and it's kind of like he deserves it type of a thing, right? Be, be the original one, be the first one to do it. But during the game, it's like, it's not a dead ball and it's going fast. And so I just said something like, I think I was, I said, hey, come up with your own celebration, be original, right? <laughs> and so, and so people, people took that and were like, oh, he's hating on LaMelo and it's, you know, and I'm thinking in my head when I was thinking, I'm like, I'm giving props to LaMelo and Carmelo when I say this. And so, and so people kind of took it and blew it up and, and I was like, man, they really think I'm hating on LaMelo. So I just thought that was funny <laughs> that, that people really thought I was serious. It was like all for fun. I'm the same person. So before Eric Paschal did like a, a raising the roof celebration and I gave him, I think it was like a C plus for lack of commitment to the celebration because it was just like a quick <laughs> raise the roof. Thing. So this is something I just do for fun and I just blurted it out and it was fast in the flow of the game. And I guess people thought I was really upset that he was doing this celebration and that it's, it's Carmelo's. He shouldn't steal it. He should come up with something else. And then someone said, I call you called, you called LaMelo out for doing the celebration. I'm like, no, 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 no. I wasn't, I wasn't hating on him. I was the whole game. I was talking about how much I love his game and how he brought the swag back to the organization. This is a guy that I've, I've loved since he got drafted. I've been talking about how amazing he is and how great he's going to be. So I, I just thought that was funny. And then, and then Carmelo obviously came out. It was like, yeah, I embrace him. And people are like, ah, see, see, look, he can do the celebration. You shut up. I'm like, yeah, I, uh, hey, this, I love it. Yes, of course, look, Carmelo loves it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's paying homage and all that stuff. I was just having some fun on the broadcast. So I just, I just thought that was funny how kind of people, I guess, I guess during the broadcast, I had to make sure that I'm cognizant of people that don't actually always watch the broadcast and realize that people can take a snippet out. And I guess for some people, it'll sound like, you know, whatever they want it to sound like if they, you know, they want to tag it all this, this announcer or color commentator is hating on LaMelo Ball. I'm like, I have no hate in my blood. I promise I'm not hating on the dude. It was so funny. I just, I just thought that was interesting. That's funny, man. I love that story. I'm thinking you could go one of two ways. Cause you're right. You can, they'll take a little snippet and they don't know you had, I don't know, 47 minutes worth of beautiful comments about LaMelo. They have no idea. Yeah, so you could exactly. you could tag it out with hashtag kidding. I don't know. You can do that. <laughs> it's quick. It'll still fit the sound bite. Or you could just swing the other way. And let's go with uh, hating. You could just be like, D yeah, minus, so get your own. <laughs> you know, just go yeah, for it. Yeah, that's Carmelo's. What are you doing? He's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I should have done. I should have just, like, just kept going on the broadcast. And, and just just have like this whole you know rant about people stealing celebrations and people would really think I'm upset about a celebration. But it's so funny because during the game, like Lamelo, one of, he was in our open. Like we had a game before that in Charlotte. You you know what happened with Draymond? How that one ended? I think. Yeah. And, and the Charlotte Hornets won that one, but he was in our open. We were talking amazing about him, his passing ability. We're trying to figure out how to guard him. So there's the whole broadcast. We're talking about how great LaMelo is. And so, and then I say that, like, try to give him props. Like, hey, you, he's if he starts a celebration, he's going to be the first. Then people are going to start copying in that. Be the original. He's going to be the original, right? And then it just came out as, I understand. I think I said, I understand they're both they're both mellow, but uh, what did I say? <laughs> I understand they're both mellow, but get he should come up with his own celebration, be original. 
<laughs> and that's how it came out. And that's all I said. And people just took it as, oh, he's hating on LaMelo. Wow, how dare he? Let him do the celebration. It's just a kid. I'm like, yeah, I, I, I don't, it's just a joke. It's all fun. Come on, people. That's it would funny. almost be like um, if your girl is like, how does this dress make me look? And you're like, a little bigger. But I like that. But I like it. And then you're just trying to, <laughs> like, it's been misconstrued, right? Out. Totally. Yeah, 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 yeah. Although, I mean, if you said that, that's kind of bad. I mean, you should never say that. I think any man knows. <laughs> never start with it's bigger. That's all they're going to hear. It's You got to, yeah, you I guess lying is the best way to go there, but that that'll get you in trouble. I don't I don't know. That's that'll get you on the couch for a while. I'm sure if you yeah. talk to Eddie Barry. So that's that's a little different starting that way. That's <laughs> they're gonna think, oh, there's there's uh, there's some truth in that. Why'd you say it then? But, <laughs> yeah, you got months of one. penance ahead of you. That's right, no doubt. <laughs> well, hey man, Kalena, really enjoyed it. You were a treat to talk to. So uh, fun joking around with you and great stuff about the Warriors, man. So uh, I'm more yeah. excited for the game. So well done by you. Yeah. Appreciate you having me, man. Appreciate you having me. Now go eat. Go eat. Uh, yeah, go you too. Me. Go eat something. Yeah. Will you? Yes, sir. Please. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we'll catch you later, bud. Have a good day. All right, brother. You too, man. All right. There he is. Kalena Azabuki, Warriors television analyst here on the Brian No Show. That was a lot of fun.